It is now time for question period, and I recognize the Leader of His Majesty's loyal opposition. Good morning. Good morning, Speaker. This question is for the Premier. Uh, the Information and Privacy Commissioner has confirmed she's going to be releasing a special report on his government's conduct in relation to the Greenbelt scandal. She's looking into allegations that political staffers in the government regularly deleted emails related to the Greenbelt and that they used their personal accounts in an apparent attempt to cover their tracks. The last time the commissioner released a special report into the deletion of emails by political staffers, I think we all remember what happened. It triggered a police investigation, and that Liberal Premier's chief of staff went to prison. So will the Premier enlighten us? What will this latest investigative report reveal? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Look, as we said all along, we'll uh, continue to work uh, with uh, both the Integrity Commissioner and the Information and Privacy uh, uh, Commissioner. Nothing has uh, changed uh, on that uh, uh, score, uh, Mr. Speaker. At the same time, the, uh, the Leader of the Opposition, of course, uh, references uh, 2014 and uh, uh, the previous Liberal government's uh, uh, challenges. Uh, I do recall at that time uh, that the Liberals, uh, the NDP, had an opportunity at that point to vote their confidence in the government or lack thereof, and the NDP chose to keep that government in office despite the fact that the Chief of Staff after, went to jail, Mr. Week Speaker. After, we continue Order. to do what is important for the people of the province of Ontario that is focus on building homes, Order. focus on building an economy out of the ashes of what the previous Liberal government left behind, Mr. Speaker, and on every account. We're making progress. The job is not yet done, Mr. Speaker, but we'll continue on that path of economic growth and prosperity for people of Pakistan. Order. Supplementary question. Mr. Speaker, you would have thought they would have learned a lesson, but there's more. Earlier today, Global News revealed new evidence that the Premier's Chief of Staff used his personal email account to conduct government business on dozens of occasions. That directly contradicts his sworn testimony to the Integrity Commissioner when he claimed, and I'm going to quote him, I do not conduct government business on my personal email, but guess what? He does. The Premier's Chief of Staff appears to have repeatedly and directly contradicted his sworn testimony to the Integrity Commissioner under oath. So, Speaker, to the Premier, will he demand his Chief of Staff's resignation? From the House Leader. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker. Look, as I just said, uh, we continue to work with uh, the uh, Information and Privacy Commissioner and the Integrity Commissioner. If the Leader of the Opposition has any additional information that she would like to provide the Integrity Commissioner, I uh, encourage her uh, uh, to do so, uh, uh, Speaker. This government, of course, is continuing to focus on what is important to the people of the province of Ontario. There's no, there's no doubt uh, that we inherited uh, a challenging circumstances back in 2018. We are continuing on the path to rebuild the province of Ontario, that is to focus on building more homes uh, across the province of Ontario, rebuilding uh, our economy. The job is not done yet, Mr. Speaker. We'll continue to focus uh, on, uh, on that. Uh, and I encourage the Leader of the Opposition to work with us so that we can continue to build a bigger, better, stronger province of Ontario for the people of the province. The final supplementary. No surprise that the Premier doesn't want to answer these questions. Uh, it's not just about the Premier's Chief of Staff, actually, because it goes right to the top. An FOI document uh, obtained by the NDP has also revealed that the Premier's Director of Stakeholder Relations was also using his personal email to set up a meeting and discuss the Greenbelt scheme with one of those land speculators, Sergio Mancha. You're going to recall, Speaker, that Ryan Amato told his colleagues, and I quote, the Premier needs to stop calling this guy. Well, you know what? He was calling this guy. So was his, uh, so was his Director of Stakeholder Relations. And so I want to know from the Premier, did he discuss this Greenbelt property with Mr. Mancha, with his Director of Stakeholder Relations, or any other public official in the summer of 2022? <laughs> I honestly think that uh, question uh, directly contradicts the first two questions because the Leader of the Opposition highlights that through an FOI she was able to receive information uh, from the government uh, with respect to uh, the Greenbelt, Mr. Speaker. I encourage the Leader of the Opposition, if she has uh, some additional information that she would like to provide the Integrity Commissioner, I encourage her uh, to do so. Uh, speaker, we continue to work on, uh, on what's important to the, pe the people of the province of Ontario. 
Look, we are fighting a number of issues that uh, that would help improve the people uh, of the province of Ontario's lives. But speak, we've talked about a carbon tax, how difficult that has been on the people of the province of Ontario. The Premier has led the Federation in terms of asking the Bank of Canada to reduce interest rates because it has become so difficult for people not only to get shovels in the ground, but for the people who can buy those homes to actually afford those homes. We are building infrastructure. Bonds. We are building more schools, Mr. Speaker. We are reinvesting in health care. Those are the priorities of the people of the province of Ontario. We are going to double down and make sure that we continue to build a bigger, better, stronger province. The next question, once again, the Leader of the Opposition. Speaker, the uh, member doesn't have to worry because it's going to go straight to the RCMP, That's all right. that information. Let me tell you. This, uh, this question is for the Premier again, and we've known for decades, decades, that mercury was being dumped in the Wabagoon English River system, uh, that it was poisoning the people of Grassy Narrows. Uh, first, it gets into the fish, which is central to the way of life there, and now, of course, devastating the community. Last week, a new study revealed that industrial discharge from the Dryden Mill site is making that mercury contamination even worse. Shamefully, Speaker, there has been no comment from this government these ministers, since this new information came to light, crickets, nothing. So when will this government commit to cleaning up the river of all of the mercury that's contaminating grassy narrows? To apply, Minister of Environment, Conservation and Parks. Uh, Speaker, our government remains committed to working with Indigenous communities and will continue working with Indigenous communities towards remediation of the mercury contamination in the English and the Wagagoon rivers. The member knows that several studies have been funded to the tune of $85 million for the English and Wagagoon River Remediation Trust, including the recent one by Dr. Renfern. And those studies are to understand the mercury contamination, where it's moving through the river system and the food web. Ministry technical experts will be reviewing the report's finding as part of their work on the panel a technical, uh, in their technical subcommittee, and they plan to meet with the doctor and the Indigenous community tomorrow. Thank you, Speaker. And a supplementary question. Methyl mercury levels are now even higher, two times higher, Speaker. The chief scientist behind the study says that if the mill stopped discharging sulfate into the river, they could have prevented harmful chemicals getting into the river and into the fish. Children, elders, poisoned under this government's watch, studies, reviews, that's all we ever hear from this minister. What immediate steps is this government going to take right now? to stop the ongoing mercury poisoning of the people of Grassy Narrows. Uh, thank you, Speaker. And as I said, our government remains committed to working with the Indigenous community towards remediation. Many know who've been working on this project for, day, uh, for days and months and years know that the panel is nearing the end of the characterization phase and sufficient scientific information has been collected to, the be to begin the development of remediation objectives and goals. Speaker, our government takes Order. this issue very seriously. The panel is also funding a project team made up of recognized mercury remediation experts. We will leave it to the experts to ensure that swift and remediation action is taking place. Speaker, we remain committed to updating the Indigenous community and stakeholders, including the public, towards the progress of remediation of mercury contamination sediments. Final supplementary, the member for Kiwetnam. Uh, Miigwech, Speaker. Uh, studying the study doesn't seem uh, like much of a plan of action, Speaker. In Sarnia, where the Amjanong First Nation have been complaining of illnesses from benzene released from a nearby chemical plant, the ministry finally ordered the plant to <laughs> cease operations until there was a fix. So it is possible to take the necessary action. So again, to the Premier, after decades, more than 50 years, Speaker, in fact, uh, with the new information about the ongoing contamination making mercury poisoning impacting the people of Grassy Narrows worse, what steps is he prepared to 
end this ongoing tragedy once and for all. Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks. Uh, thank you, Speaker. And as I mentioned, we will continue to take this matter very seriously. It, we've been working on it um, for quite some time with the Indigenous community towards the remediation of mercury contamination. We will listen to the subject matter experts. Uh, Minister of Technical experts will be on hand. A meeting as, is organized as early as tomorrow uh, to ensure that there's a path forward on this, and we will take all the necessary um, studies and all the necessary information in hand, Speaker, and we do take this very seriously, and we'll get to the bottom of the remediation of this project. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next question, the Leader of the Opposition. That was a disappointing response from the Minister, and uh, I will point out there were no answers there for the people of Grassy Narrows. Um, people are struggling all across this province to find a family doctor. Uh, rural emergency rooms are closing all across the province. Uh, but this government, they have very different priorities. On Friday, we learned that the taxpayers of Ontario could be paying half a billion dollars so that this premier can get out of a contract a year early and sell beer and wine in corner stores. Now, I want to know why is this premier pouring money into the pockets of these big alcohol corporations while our emergency rooms are closing? Uh, the parliamentary assistant to the Minister of Finance and member for Oakville. Thank you, Speaker. And, you know, the question really shows why. We have two new members in the House here today in the, from the last by-elections, from Lampton, Kent, Middlesex, and from Milton, Speaker, because the NDP and the Liberals are obviously against workers. Our government is supporting workers in a transition after a 97-year monopoly. Let me repeat that, a 97-year monopoly. The people of Ontario want modernization, they want convenience, and they want change. They are supportive of what we are doing. Clearly, the opposition, Liberals and NDP, support the, the, the status quo, which has been corporate monopolies. 97 Order. years. Our government Response. is the first government in the history of Ontario to get it done for the people of Ontario. We ran on this in 2018 and 2022, and the people— <laughs> Supplementary question. Yeah, Premier, uh, Speaker, uh, the minister <laughs> knows perfectly well that they are giving that same monopoly, that corporate consortium, a, a quarter of a billion dollars. <laughs> taxpayers, taxpayers' hard-earned dollars. Order. Families across this province are wondering if they're going to be able to keep a roof over their heads, right? Families are looking for affordable childcare. There's none, right? They can't find a family doctor. 2.4 million Ontarians without a family doctor. People worried whether there's going to be an emergency room open when their child is sick. These are the worries that are keeping people in this province up at night. So, Speaker, I want to go back to the Premier. Maybe he'll actually answer the question for a change. More than half a billion dollars. Does that actually sound like a good deal for the pe people of this province from this Premier? Give me a break. The member for Ottawa South will come to order. To reply, the Premier. For, for, first of all, thank, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I know the opposition, they can't add numbers because it's, it's, that's not the number. But anyways, uh, Mr. Speaker, we had a deal, the worst deal I've ever seen in business, what the Liberals signed for 10 years, just giving money away. <coughs> We're here order. to support the workers at the beer store. Order. We're creating 8,500 new stores, thousands and thousands of jobs. The LCBO is going to be the wholesaler. They're going to bring in a couple hundred million dollars more. But guess what, Mr. Speaker? They want to say no. They want to say no on the beer tax increase. They want to say more, no to more competitive retailing pricing. But I'll guarantee you one thing, Mr. Speaker. I will guarantee you. Order. 
All these members here, every single person, will be going into their retail store, they'll be going into their key, uh, convenience store to buy their wine, to buy their, their beer, guaranteed 1,000%. Order. The official opposition come to order. The next order. The Premier will come to order. The member for Hamilton Mountain will come to order. The member for Ottawa South will come to order. The member for Hamilton Mountain will come to order, and, and we do not refer to the absence of a member. <laughs> member for Brampton North will come to order. The next question, the member for Perth Wellington. Thank you, Speaker. I think everyone was just excited for my question this morning. I'd really like to ask a question to the Premier, but unfortunately my question is to the Minister of Energy. The Liberal carbon tax is driving up the cost of food and everyday essentials. It continues to force individuals and families across our province between cooling and eating. Speaker. Just last week, we learned that the grocery prices in Ontario have increased by an additional 1.5 percent compared to last year. At the same time, food bank usage in our province has increased by 38 per cent. Speaker, Order. the Liberals, under the carbon tax queen, Bronnie Crombie, along with the opposition NDP, persistently ignore the effects of this tax have on our, farm, our, our food supply chain. They should meet with the grain farmers who are here today and hear about Question. how much this tax costs our farmers. As the opposition champions the carbon tax, our government will keep costs down for the people of Ontario, and we will not stop until this regressive tax is scrapped. Minister, can you please explain? Thank you. Thank you. Minister of Energy. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Thanks to the great member from Perth Wellington who celebrated a birthday last week as well. I should say. Um, Mr. Speaker, I think. All of us in this House should know by now the damage that the carbon tax is doing. And I know the Premier probably would have loved to answer this question because he's been telling us since 2018 that we would be in the place that we are now because of the carbon tax and it increasing every year on April 1st. We've gotten to the point now where people are cancelling their summer holidays because they can't afford to fill up their tank and go Spons. visit great locations across our province, Mr. Speaker. The carbon tax is driving up the price of everything the grain farmers will tell you that too. Three billion dollars. Yep, thank you. Thank you very much. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you to the Minister for his response. The carbon tax is failing on all fronts, except driving up the cost of basic necessities. The federal Liberals can reduce the cost of food today for children, for seniors, and for everyone who's going hungry by eliminating this punitive tax. But unfortunately, Speaker, it seems they're all willing to let Ontarios suffer on this, under this carbon tax. The Liberal and NDP members sitting in this House are content to see the carbon tax triple, triple by 2030, Speaker. This is unacceptable, and this Premier and our government will continue to fight this punitive tax. Minister, can you tell this House why the members opposite must come to their senses and join our government in fighting this carbon tax? Mr. Hamilton Mountain, come, come to order. Minister of Energy. I'll tell you why they should come to their senses. They will be eradicated, and they won't have any seats left at the federal parliament, and they won't have any seats Order. left on this side either. And the two new members over there from Lambton, Kent, Middlesex, and Milton, they Yay! heard this at the doors just over a month ago when they went to the polls, and we talk to people across Ontario all the time, and they say the biggest issue that they're facing is affordability. Now, it's not because of the things that we're doing here at the province, because we're doing as much as we can to make life more affordable by reducing the gas tax, by bringing in one fare for transit users, saving them $1,600 a year, cutting tolls, cutting license plate fees, cutting all of those different fees that are driving up the cost. But it's this carbon tax, Mr. Speaker. It's the carbon tax that 
driving up the price of everything. And the Queen of the Carbon Tax, Bonnie Crombie, and the Liberals, and the NDP, and Mr. Green here, Bonds. are all in support of a bigger carbon tax, Mr. Speaker. We're not. We have a different plan. Powering Ontario's growth is working. Okay. Member for Waterloo will come to order. I remind the House to refer to the other members by either their riding name or their ministerial uh, responsibility as applicable. The next question, the member for Ottawa West Nepean. Thank you, Speaker. Every parent knows that without caring, qualified teachers and education workers, there is no education. Yet this government's cuts to education funding, their refusal to take action on violence and mental health, and their contempt for teachers is driving them out of our schools. There are now 46,000 teachers in Ontario who are certified but choosing not to teach at a moment when our schools have daily staff shortages. Why isn't the Minister of Education doing everything he can to reverse this trend and make sure our kids have the caring teachers they need? To reply. Minister of Education. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. You know, our government in 2017-18 came in with a mandate to increase mental health funding because the former Liberals underfunded this area, investing roughly 16 to 18 million dollars per year. Under our Premier's leadership, we are investing over 110 million dollars, over a 550% net increase in funding, a commitment to invest. We also announced a plan to mandate uh, mental health within the curriculum to reduce the behavioral challenges we're seeing, but also to strengthen the resilience of young people. We were the first province in Canada to mandate in every single grade. And then, under the leadership of the member from Burlington, we codified a toolkit developed with School Mental Health Ontario and the Hospital for Sick Children. Mr. Speaker, if we want to deal with violence, then we need to unite people around our shared values, not subdivide them as many members of the liberal opposition would want us to do. We need to stand up for shared Fox. values in Canada. We have to make sure young people know that through mental health and upstream investments, we can prevent the distractions in class and keep every single child safe in our system. The supplementary question. Speaker, this government's funding for mental health is going down to 22 cents per student per day. That is a cut from this year. That is not how you take a mental health crisis seriously. And the teacher shortage is connected to the rising levels of violence and the mental health crisis in our schools. One teacher from Waterloo wrote to me, I'm in a K-6 school. This week so far, we've had a non-verbal student elope and run off campus. Three different students trash three different classrooms. One staff member get assaulted by a student and two class evacuations, and it's only Wednesday. These aren't just teachers' working conditions, Speaker. They are stu students' learning conditions. So where is the serious plan to tackle violence in schools? Minister of Education. A comprehensive plan to empower students to learn about mental health in every single grade started years ago under our government. We increased funding in every single year. This is the first year students are benefiting from year-round supports of mental health, including through the summers, which members opposite oppose. We've increased the staffing by 9,000 education workers in our schools, 3,000 frontline teachers. I know the member the leader of the opposition can't bring herself to accept matters of fact as confirmed by school boards in the province of Ontario. But if she is so committed to mental health, then why have you voted against each and every single Order. mental health worker, psychologist, psychotherapist, Order. social worker we've hired? I know the inconvenient truth of the NDP. They voted against budgets. They voted against curriculum. They've even voted against a toolkit developed by Sick Kids Ontario. But, Mr. Speaker, we brought forth a plan to, to actually go after the issue of distractions in schools by eliminating vaping and cell phone distractions, keeping kids safe. <laughs> Member for Hamilton West and Pastor Dundas, come to order. Member for Hamilton Mountain, come to order. The member for Waterloo, come to order. The next question. Next question, the member for Scarborough Agent Court. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Great. Ontario's farmers pride themselves on being great stewards of the land and the environment. But, Speaker, the federal Liberals refuse to take that into account when they saddle farmers with huge carbon tax bills. Not only does the carbon tax add 
financial stress by increasing input costs for farmers, but it shows great disrespect for the work farmers do and the investments they make to keep their operations as sustainable as possible. That's right. The federal liberals need to finally listen to what we have been saying since day one and get rid of the carbon tax. Here. Speaker, Question. can the minister please tell this House what she is hearing from farmers about how the federal liberals' attacks are impacting them both financially? Thank you very much. Thank you. Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Speaker, and I appreciate the question from the member from Scarborough Agent Court. Quite frankly, I'm hearing from farmers and food manufacturers alike that carbon tax is driving up the cost of production, the cost of food throughout this province. Yep. And we need to keep good companies like D D Poultry in that member's own riding thriving because Ontario looks for it and deserves it. Quite frankly, I'm hearing from farmers as well that it's becoming an affordability issue, Speaker, because carbon tax is affecting them both financially and, quite frankly, emotionally as well. You know, Jeff Harrison, president of Grain Farmers of Ontario, is in the House today, and he recently has been quoted on record as saying that, reflecting on Liberal ideology about climate change, the Liberals we're using a vilification strategy to pin the blame on for climate change on farmers through exorbitant costs of the carbon tax and threatening to remove tools that farmers need to grow crops. The Liberals are do doing the wrong thing. A supplementary question. Thank you to the Minister for the response. It is disturbing to hear how the Liberal carbon tax is not only driving up the cost of businesses for Ontario's farmers, but causing them personal stress as well. Speaker, unlike our government's continued support of our agriculture and food industry, the opposition NDP and the independent Liberals would rather support this costly and regressive tax. They are saying no to economic growth and prosperity and saying no to supporting farmers and Ontario businesses. That's shameful. Ontario have enough scrap. Ontario had had enough scrap the tax. Speaker, can the minister tell the House what our government is doing Question. to help agriculture and food businesses compete in global market despite federal carbon tax? Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. You know, we're doing a lot to support our farmers because, quite frankly, Jeff Harrison also went on to say, and I quote, you know, it's part of the added stress, it being the carbon tax, is added stress on farmers that, and they are expected to do the unachievable. But really and truly, farmers are part of the solution, Speaker. Through their crop rotations, cover crops, and the embracing of best practices, grain farmers of Ontario are actually shipping almost 30 per cent of all grains right here grown in Ontario around the world to 50 different countries. Yeah. That matters. And then there's another significant percentage of their production that goes into baked goods right here on Ontario, which adds to jobs and, again, <laughs> goes around the world in terms of satisfying demand for good produced food right here from Ontario. But you know what, Speaker? Response. The carbon tax alone is going to cost grain farmers of Ontario to pay, get this, almost $200 million in carbon tax alone this year. That's why we're introducing programs that understand the issue. and. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Kiwetanong. Miigwetza, uh, Speaker. Uh, first responders, including police officers across the north, often work alone. They are the first ones uh, who see accidents and tragedies when they happen, but they are not given the tools they need to process the traumatic events. Speaker, uh, will this government commit to increasing the mental health supports available to police and other first responder, responders, such as paramedics and firefighters serving in far northern Ontario. Mr. General. 
Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate the question from the member from Kuwetnan. Mr. Speaker, last summer I've travelled up to Laxville First Nations and the members' riding, and I saw firsthand exactly how important it is to have public safety in communities like Laxville. And I want to give a special mention to Chief Bruno Rossi, who works hard every day to keep that community safe. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, the welfare of every person living safely in their communities, regardless of whether it's in Southern Ontario or Northern Ontario or in First Nations communities, is equally important. Everyone keeping Ontario safe deserve to be safe themselves. And Mr. Speaker, just in a couple of weeks, I will be at the Ontario Police College, where we welcome almost 500 new cadets to keep Ontario safe, including people serving our First Nations communities. The supplementary question. Miigwech, uh, Speaker. Uh, visiting communities does not increase funding to provide the mental health services that these people need. Mm -hmm. uh, speaker, uh, again, uh, first responders in the north work with far fewer services than urban responders in urban areas. Even services like mental health services are extremely limited. Frontline uh, responders like Jerry Muscatonine like Jack McKay, have told us they aren't getting the support they need when they're experiencing uh, vicarious trauma. How does this government plan to ensure the complex mental health needs of police and frontline responders in the North are met? the Associate Minister of Mental Health and Addictions. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and that is a very important question, and it is something that our government is taking very seriously. As you know, with $525 million being invested through the Roadmap to Wellness, we're ensuring that we're addressing mental health issues in every segment of the community, in every segment of the population, and ensuring that first responders are getting the help that they need regardless of where they are in the province. One of the biggest investments made by this government is a center of excellence that's in the process of being built for first responders, and it will act as a hub-and-spoke model to ensure that supports are provided to first responders no matter where they are in the province at the best and highest level possible. In addition to that, our government is making investments in mobile crisis intervention teams to be able to provide additional supports to the people that are in the greatest need, but working with the first responders, not just police officers, but with paramedics Bonds. as well. So as we build the system, and the system that was for the longest time left unserved, we're making the differences and building a system that's going to be the best it can be for everyone in the province, including our... Thank you. The next question, the member for Don Valley East. For the Premier, Mr. Speaker. $1 billion of taxpayer money is currently on its way to the Premier's wealthy, well-connected friends at the Beer Store and LCBO. Mr. Speaker, this isn't about convenience. This is about favouring insiders, furthering political agendas, and justifying an early election. And meanwhile, due to this government's historic underfunding and stunning incompetence, the Township of Durham is the latest rural hospital to find itself on the chopping block. This is the same playbook that shuttered Minden Hospital's emergency department and which now threatens the collapse of Bracebridge's hospital. First, the Premier and Minister of Health neglect the needs of rural and northern hospitals, and staffing is foremost amongst those needs. Yet the Premier and Minister of Health have deliberately chosen to underpay health care workers, drag them through court, let temporary staffing agencies run wild and ignore the issues of burnout, mental health and workplace safety. Question. When hospitals like the one in Durham have, uh, no longer have enough staff to function. What does this government do? They give a billion dollars to the beer store and LCBO. That was easy. Mr. Speaker, why is the Premier paying off big beer rather than doing anything to keep... Thank you. The Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. You know, I'm not sure if the member opposite was around for the budget, 
where we actually increased hospitals' um, annual operating by an average of 4%. Wow. We've done that for two years running. We have, in February, seen a historic in investment in primary care expansion, 78 new primary care or expanded opportunities for people to be connected to primary care physicians and clinicians in their community. We are already seeing those investments making a difference in the lives of people who want to be connected. I would encourage the member opposite to actually sit down with some of these hospital CEOs and leadership and find out what and how our government investments are making a difference on the ground. They Response. The supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the government is giving a billion dollars to the beer store and big box grocery stores and only $100 million to increase access to primary care at a time when more health care workers are leaving the profession than ever before. This government is telling us that things have never been better. The amount of people without a family doctor has increased by more than 800,000 since this government took office. And they want to talk about beer. That doesn't cut it for patients in Durham, whose emergency department now operates on bankers' hours, who will have to be driven out of their community, often in dangerous winter conditions and away from loved ones, just to get a hospital bed. Soon diagnostic services will drive, and doctors are already leaving. But it doesn't end there. Developers were planning two residential communities in Durham that would have totaled 500 homes. When news broke out that the community could soon be without Question. a hospital, those developers pulled out. The Minister of Health's failures are now turning into the Minister of Housing's failures. Mr. Speaker, how does the Premier expect to meet his housing targets if he can't even ensure that health care needs are met in every community across Ontario? Order. Order. Minister of Health. This is a time for a bit of a history lesson. When the Liberal government was in power, they were cutting residency spots in the province of Ontario. When the NDP were in government, they were cutting nurses in the province of Ontario. Contrast that with new medical schools that will have students actually starting their training in September of 2025 in Brampton. We have a new medical school coming in Scarborough. We have a new medical school coming in York Region. We are making those investments because, frankly, it was ignored for far too long under the Liberal government as supported by the NDP. We're getting the job done. Yeah. The next question, the member for Bruce Gray Owen Sound. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Energy. As the cost of living continues to rise, Ontarians cannot afford the costly federal carbon tax. Right. But, Speaker, the federal Liberals do not care, and neither do the Ontario Liberals under the ca carbon tax queen, Bonnie Crombie. They will push for more hikes until this tax gets tripled. And even though Ontarians are paying the price for their unfair tax grabs, unlike the Liberals, our government understands the importance of building our clean energy advantage while keeping costs down for the hardworking people of this province. Speaker, can the minister explain how our government is bringing Ontarians clean, affordable and reliable energy without introducing a carbon tax? Good idea. Minister of Energy. Well, uh, you know, not to put words in the mouth of the premier, but the premier would say no tax. For you, we are not going to be increasing taxes, and that includes a carbon tax, Mr. Speaker. And our plan does not include a carbon tax. Our plan is called Powering Ontario's Growth, and it builds on the strengths of our province's energy sector. That includes refurbishing the clean, reliable, affordable power that comes from our nuclear plants at places like Bruce and at Darlington and at Pickering, building new nuclear technology, small modular reactors, world leading small modular reactors that are underway now at Darlington as well, ensuring that we have clean hydroelectric power that's affordable for the people by refurbishing the big dams and the small dams that we have across our province at places like Niagara Falls, at places like Cornwall, Response. at places like Northern Ontario, all across our province, and ensuring that we have just finished the biggest procurement of battery storage in Canada's history. A supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for his response. It is encouraging to hear the progress our government has made, been making to ensure Ontario has clean, 
affordable energy to power our growing economy. Rather than providing energy solutions, the federal Liberals have deliberately chosen not only to leave the carbon tax in place, but to increase it even more despite the financial struggles Ontarians are experiencing. Speaker, Ontarians deserve relief, not taxes. The simplest, fairest thing to do is to scrap the carbon tax for everyone, everywhere, for good. Speaker, can the minister please tell this House why the people of this province cannot afford the punitive Liberal carbon tax? Minister of Energy. We can't afford it because it's driving up the price of everything, and even a report to Parliament in uh, Ottawa last week indicated that the carbon tax is having very, very little impact, less than 1 per cent on reducing emissions across the province, Mr. Speaker. So all it's doing is driving people into energy poverty. Our grain farmers are here. They've talked about the impact that it's having on grains that they produce for our baked goods and our spirits and all kinds of great stuff in our province, Mr. Speaker, and it's having an impact at the grocery stores. But the queen of the carbon tax, Bonnie Crombie and her Liberal caucus and the NDP and the Green Party as well, they're all in support of an ever-increasing carbon tax every April 1st, Mr. Speaker. Now, we're not. We're saying no to the carbon tax, first of all, because it's not working, and second of all, because it's driving up costs Response. and making life more affordable for the people of Ontario. We have a plan. It's working. It's called Powering Ontario's Growth, Bringing Record Multi-Billion Dollar Investment. Thank you. The next question, the member for Toronto Centre. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Ontario's justice system has made recent headlines for all the wrong reasons. City TV News has broadcasted Stop with the Excuses, emotional appeals to overhaul court system amid growing backlogs. Toronto Star Prince, defence lawyer for accused in terrorism case, wants charges stayed due to court delays. CBC reports mold, asbestos in Milton courtroom have led to delay delays in the judicial process. Is the Premier actually proud of these headlines that his government has garnered? <laughs> The Attorney General. Hey, Mr. Speaker, and thank you for the question. It gives me a chance to highlight some of the amazing things that we're doing as a government, Mr. Speaker, and things that only this Order. government is prepared to do. At a time when the opposition is calling to defund the police, Mr. Speaker, we are supporting our frontline officers. We're making sure that the justice system has the tools that it needs to work the way that Ontarians would expect, Mr. Speaker. We are investing new money, millions of dollars, Mr. Speaker, in new systems, Order. in staffing, Mr. Speaker, in all areas of the justice system. We are getting the job done, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Speaker. Legal observers have a very different opinion of what success in the judicial system looks like. The crisis goes beyond the courts. We see the crisis of mismanagement with the historic backlogs in tribunals. Tribunal Watch, which is an independent, nonpartisan watchdog of tribunal systems in Ontario, has revealed in their annual report that the Human Rights Tribunal Ontario backlog grew by 500 cases, despite historically high rates of applications being dismissed without ever being heard, or the fact that the complainants are now abandoning their applications due to record delays at the tribunals. On top of these historic delays there, we're seeing historic delays now also at the landlord tenant board without any fixes in sight. Yes or no, is the Premier also proud of his record in the tribunals? To respond, the Premier. Mr. Speaker, I just find it so ironic coming, coming from that member that wants to defund the police, that marched in the parades, defund the police, and if it was up to that member, you wouldn't even, Order. you could break into a, a house, you could put a gun to someone's head, you could steal something from the store. She would, she Order. doesn't believe they should even be in court. Order. Everyone should get off according to you, everyone. Give them a second chance after breaking into a home, terrorizing neighborhoods. She doesn't worry about the courts, she hates the police. You know something, it's just a bunch of, you know what. <laughs> I'll leave it at that. Order. The next question, the member for Guelph. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. Extreme heat is already here. Fire season started early. Toxic air from fires last year cost our health care system $1.3 billion. Climate-fueled extreme weather 
cost insurable losses of $3.1 billion last year alone. The cost of climate is rising rapidly, and Ontario has gone from first to worst when it comes to climate pollution. In fact, 60 per cent of the increase in climate pollution in Canada came from Ontario. Yet the Auditor General government says side, this go government on. has no plan. Speaker, the people of Ontario want a credible climate plan. So all I'm asking for today is a date, a date of when the government will deliver a credible climate plan to meet Ontario's emission targets. Minister of Energy. Well, first of all, Speaker, let me start with our energy plan, which was delivered last summer. I can uh, send the member over a copy. It's called Powering Ontario's Growth, and that's exactly what's happening, maintaining one of the cleanest grids in the entire world, Mr. Speaker. Now, the member opposite from the Green Party wants to put wind turbines and solar panels all over the place. And, you know, let's, let's just look outside today. It's raining cats and dogs out there, Mr. Speaker. We are getting 100 megawatts of solar today, and we're getting about 1,300 megawatts of wind, of 5,000 megawatts of installed capacity. Can you imagine, under their plan, how many wind turbines and solar panels they would need that still wouldn't be working today? That's why we're investing in our nuclear power plants, emissions-free. We are getting almost 60 percent of our electricity from there today and our hydroelectric facilities. The member for Nepean will come to order. The member for Ottawa South will come to order. The supplementary question back to the member for Guelph. Thank you, Speaker. That answer, I believe, just increased emissions in the province. Let's get to the facts. Here are the facts, Speaker. When this government came into office, our grid was 96 percent clean. Now it's down to 87 percent clean. And under their plan, Climate pollution in the electricity sector will rise 300 per cent this decade and 700 per cent in the next two decades, undermining all the progress we made closing coal plants. The government has no plan, and the plan that the minister just talked about is actually going to make climate pollution go up. At a time when we have tornado warnings in Ottawa right now today. We are, the cost of the climate crisis is going up, Order. and emissions are going up under this government. And the people of Ontario have a simple question, question they want an answer to. When will the government bring forward a credible plan to meet Ontario's emission targets? Once again, the member for Nepean come to order. The, member, the minister for energy. Thanks very much. And uh, we've seen this type of act before in this legislature. What the uh, member of the Green Party is supporting is the Green Energy Act, which drove hundreds of thousands of jobs out of our province, Mr. Speaker. And you know what? It hasn't just been Ontario's experience. We've seen what's happening in places like Germany. We've seen what's happening in California, where they've gone down these roads. They don't have power for the growth that we're experiencing in our province. We are guaranteeing that we will have the growth. Now, now, the member talks about the fact that our emissions are going up. You know what? We are, we are refurbishing our nuclear facilities right now. We have four reactors that are down. When they come back, we're going to have more than enough power as we continue to see investment in our province. Now, we are also building out non-emitting resources right across our province because we're putting Response. the storage in place, Mr. Speaker, something that the Liberals didn't know enough to do. And we're continuing to build out our hydroelectric fleets in places like Niagara Falls, in Cornwall, in Kakabeka Falls, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. The next question, the member for Scarborough Centre. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question for the great Associate Minister of Small Business. The federal government's carbon tax continues to make life more expensive for Ontarians. Speakers, small business owners across our province cannot afford a high price for essential goods and services driven by this punitive tax. Unfortunately, the NDP and Liberal members in the legislature are ignoring the devastation impact of carbon tax on our job creators. Their silence is a shocking endorsement for high price and more tax. Unlike the opposition, our government 
is taking action supporting Ontarian hard-working businesses owner during their difficult economic times. Speaker, can the Associate Minister Question. tell the House how carbon tax compound the financial pressure of Ontario's small businesses? The Associate Minister for Small Business. Well, thank you, Speaker. And the great man from Scarborough Centre is absolutely right yes. about the harmful impact the carbon tax is having in our province's small businesses. The tax is not only driving up fuel costs for transportation and deliveries, but it's also increasing prices across the board for energy, goods and services that these entrepreneurs rely upon. Speaker, think of a family business in Milton started by immigrants who came to this country seeking more opportunities for their families. Instead, thanks to the Liberals, their dream of entrepreneurship is now struggling under the weight of these earth surging operating expenses brought on by the federal carbon tax. Speaker, these businesses see Ontario's PC government, led by Premier Ford, providing relief by cutting gas taxes Response. and the small business corporate income tax rate. And Speaker, the choice was clear in Milton and Lambton, Ken Middlesex entrepreneurs, because only our party. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank the Associate Minister for her great response. The Liberals need to finally recognize the economic reality and harm the carbon tax is causing for individuals and family. Mr. Speaker, I've met with countless small business owners in my riding of Scarborough Centre, from restaurants to auto repair shops, dry cleaners, who are being punished by soaring costs driving, driven by the Liberal carbon tax. They all tell me the increasing price to utility, supply and transportation have made it extremely difficult for business to survive. It is not fair that the Federal Liberal continue to punish Ontarians with tax hikes after tax hike. Mr. Speaker, Question. can the Associate Minister explain what our government is doing to support these vital job creators and offset the damage caused by the Liberal carbon tax supported by Bonnie. Thank you. The Associate Minister. Well, thank you, Speaker, and again to the great member for his question. Speaker, our government is committed to keeping Ontario the best place for entrepreneurs to start and grow a business. Unlike the Liberals and the opposition NDP, we know that now more than ever, the carbon tax is making it increasingly difficult for businesses to thrive and survive. And that's why, on top of our small business support programs, we've introduced major tax cuts and relief measures to directly lower operating expenses, like reducing the small business tax rate to 3.2%, increasing the employer health tax exemption, and reducing the WSIB premium rates. Entrepreneurs in Milton and Lambton, Kent, Middlesex, and right across Ontario all agree they want a government that fights for businesses, not against them. Speaker, Costly Crombie and her federal Liberals are all piling on more costs through the carbon tax, but under this Premier, we can all come to the Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Nickel Belt. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Ma question. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Question for the Minister of Health. Sources of profit for pharmacy. Pharmacists at Loblaws and Shoppers Drug Mart are being directed by their corporation to perform unnecessary med check to drive profit up and up. What has the government done to ensure that Corporation Night Law of Laws and Galen Western are not abusing our publicly funded health care system? Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. Thank you, and this gives me a wonderful opportunity to talk about the scope of practice changes that we have um, started with nurses, with nurse practitioners, and of course with pharmacists. Do you know, Speaker, that since we made changes to primary care allowing access for minor ailments in pharmacies, we've had over 700,000 Ontarians access that service. 
minor ailments where you don't have to take a day off work, where you don't have to go to the emergency department, you don't have to book an appointment and take time off work. Those are the changes that we are making through policy, through scope of practice changes that are truly making a difference in accessing primary care and accessing treatment in the province of Ontario. Thank you, Speaker. Supplementary. The difference is who gets the money, Speaker. Things are so bad that the College of Pharmacists of Ontario did a survey. The survey said shoppers and Loblaws drugstores are the two workplaces where most of the pressure happens. Pharmacists are being pressured to do more. Med check, cold calls med check, dispense naloxone, verification therapeutic check. They pressure to do more ailment assessment, but do them within a time limit. All of this generates more profit. All of this is against the, pos the position statement issued by the College of Pharmacists, putting pharmacist licenses at risk, as well as patient care. Is the government happy that shoppers in Loblaws are raking in more profit at the taxpayers' expense? Minister of Health. Speaker, this says this question is everything you need to know about where the NDP are in terms of their philosophy. They believe that the status order. quo is okay, order. that there can be no improvement Opposition in to order. here in the province of Ontario. Well, Speaker, under Premier Ford, we have a very different approach. We are going to absolutely continue to work with our regulatory colleges to expand the scope of practice, whether it's for midwives, which we've done in the last number of months, and people are already seeing impacts when they have that young baby and they want to get their their uh, midwife to have the Order. access. We will continue working with our colleges to make sure expanded scope of practice is absolutely one of the improvements that we are making in the province of Ontario. And again, I will Response. say 19 minor ailments in just over a year and a half, and we have seen over 700,000 Ontarians access that service. That's the kind of improvements we will continue to make with our health care system. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Solicitor General. From groceries to gas, the Liberal carbon tax is making life more expensive for everyone in our province. People in my riding of Newmarket Aurora have told me that they are concerned about the impact that this tax is having on our public safety system. They want to make sure that our first responders in Ontario have the tools and resources that they need to keep our community safe. Speaker, under Order. Premier Ford's leadership, our government is fighting back against crime and building safer communities, but we need all governments to do their part. The federal Liberals and their provincial counterparts need to listen Question. to what we have been saying since day one, and that is scrap this tax. Speaker, can the Solicitor General tell the House how carbon tax is negatively affecting Ontario? The Solicitor General. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank my friend, the member from Newmarket Aurora, and for standing up for public safety every day in her community and supporting York Regional Police Service. Mr. Speaker, the member is right, and I've said this before in the House, Mr. Speaker. When you look at the latest rates of carbon tax as of April 1, it's 18 cents a litre for gasoline. When you look at an average SUV at 100 litres per vehicle, you multiply a daily fill-up, you're spending $6,500 a year just for the carbon tax. Wow. It's ridiculous. And Mr. Speaker, you know who knew about it? Bonnie Crombie, because Response. she was on the board of Peel Police Service. The queen of the carbon tax knew it. She should come clean with Ontarians. Here, here. Supplementary. Thank you to the Solicitor General for the response. It is alarming to hear how the carbon tax is negatively affecting our public safety system. While our government remains focused on delivering solutions to keep Ontarians safe, the opposition NDP and independent Liberals continue to support a tax that puts Order. strain on resources for our first responders. 
Speaker, I think it is interesting that the former mayor of Mississauga, Bonnie Crombie, who would have approved the budget for her municipal fire department and understood the implications that this punitive tax was having on this budget and on her emergency support system. Question. But now, today, as the uh, leader of the independent Liberals, she is supporting the federal government and tripling this tax by 2030. James. Speaker, thank you. thank you. The Solicitor General may reply. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. The member is absolutely right. Bonnie Crombie served as mayor of Mississauga and was familiar with the budget line for the carbon tax for the Mississauga Fire Department. That is absolutely true. And you know what's true, Mr. Speaker? 21 and a half cents for diesel as of April 1, just the carbon tax portion. That means on an average fire truck, it is $15,000 a year just for the carbon tax portion. But Mr. Speaker, there's more. Bonnie Crombie wants to support the Liberals in Ottawa to triple the carbon tax, go as high as it can go. Mr. Speaker, Ontarians Response. cannot afford Bonnie Crombie. The next question, the member for London Fanshawe. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Child care operators have been warning this government since 2022 about their mismanagement on the Canadian-wide Early Learning Child Care Program file. Child care operators like Ola have already opted out, and now the Sunnyside Garden, a not-for-profit daycare, is telling us that the funding formula, if it's not fixed immediately, will be forced to either opt out or close its doors. The government's latest budget doesn't even mention child care, and last week the minister announced the government won't be releasing a new funding formula until 2025. The cost of living is hard enough for families, and families making and making families pay the price for the minister's failure to implement the $10 a day child care spaces Question. is making things worse. Will the minister commit to parents and the child care centres today? that the newly announced funding formula is a full cost recovery model and it will be implemented without further delay. Minister of Education. Mr. Speaker, what would absolutely make things worse is following the NDP plan to preclude 70,000 spaces at 30 per cent of the market. The NDP position is to literally deny 30 per cent of the market from participating, and yet today they actually ask a question about increasing wait lists. It was this progressive Conservative government that cut fees by 50 per cent, saving eight to $12,000 a year. After the NDP propped up the Liberals, increasing it by 400 per cent, pricing mothers out of the market having to choose between work and raising their kids. We're standing up for access, but we're also standing up to the federal Liberal government to make sure we get the flexibility and the funding the very operators the member opposite speaks about. They deserve. We agree with the premise of the problem. The federal program has massive Bond. shortcomings. So stand with us, stand with operators, stand up for choice, and actually get the job done for affordable. Thank you. That concludes our question period for this morning. Do you have a point?